Well, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening. Um, I'm Haley Tsukayama. I'm a senior legislative activist at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and we're really glad you joined us for this panel. Um, so just as a little setup, in November 2021, Facebook, fresh off the heels of its meta reorganization, announced it would stop using its facial recognition-based photo tagging system. In its announcement about the change, Facebook said this change will represent one of the largest shifts in facial recognition sorry, recognition usage in technology's history. More than a third of Facebook's daily active users have opted into our face recognition setting and are now able to be recognized, and its removal will result in the deletion of more than a billion people's individual facial recognition templates. It's quite a large program. Um, Facebook had previously gone to great lengths to protect its biometric data collection, including challenging a lawsuit in Illinois, which has a strong biometric privacy law, a case it ultimately settled shortly before its November announcement. When it changed its collection practices, Facebook seemed to acknowledge the controversy around face recognition and uh, um, specifically saying we need to weigh the positive use cases for facial recognition against growing societal concerns as regulators have yet to provide clear rules. So we're going to dive into uh, what face recognition technology is, how it's used, um, and specifically looking at uh, Facebook and Meta's usage of it. Um, but before we do that, I'm just going to ask my fellow panelists to introduce themselves. Whichever one of you. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Tatiana Rice. I am a lawyer and policy counsel at a nonprofit think tank called the Future of Privacy Forum. Uh, Future of Privacy Forum is a nonprofit think tank um, that works to think, works to think, <laughs> thinks about uh, privacy uh, quite a bit and how to be ethical about it, as well as making sure that we're convening place for industry, academics, researchers to ensure smart policy about privacy and tech generally. Hi, my name is Nathan White. I work for Meta now. Um, I actually ran the policy review that deprecated our facial recognition system, so I'm kind of excited to talk about this today. A uh, little bit more, um, I used to work for Congress. I worked for a member of Congress who was paranoid that the government was listening to him and studied quite a bit of international surveillance law, trying to figure out how that might be true. Um, after, after Snowden came out, that uh, experience ended up being quite helpful. Uh, went into political consulting for a while and worked at Access Now, which is an international human rights organization focusing on tech and human rights. Uh, I was there for about five years before I was recruited by Facebook to come help build the augmented reality virtual reality program, um, which was about four years ago. I've been, been with the company for four years now. Uh, and I think this is my sixth time attending DragonCon as a speaker. Um, however, it's been a while. I think 2019 might have been the last year I was here. Hello everyone, my name is Eric Null. I'm the director of the Privacy and Data Project at a nonprofit called the Center for Democracy and Technology. Uh, this is my third time up here today, so apologies for those of you who have been here for more than one time to see me today. Uh, I will be back tomorrow and on Sunday, uh, so. Get excited. Yes, if that, if that kind of thing excites you. Uh, yeah, Center for Democracy and Technology is a nonprofit that works on a, a wide variety of policy issues, privacy being one of them, but also uh, surveillance and uh, democracy, like elections and democracy and freedom of expression and all sorts of other things. And so I run the privacy and data team at CDT and our AI work, AI and facial recognition work focuses a lot on um, its use in public benefits and also uh, discrimination based on disability and, um, and in the workplace. Great. So as you can see, an all-star panel. Um, before we get too much further in, it might be a good uh, idea to step back a little and get an overview of the technology that we're talking about here. Um, Tatiana, I don't want to put you on the spot, but can you speak to a little bit about the technical aspects of the kind of technology we're looking at? Yeah, I will, and I definitely encourage anybody to jump in also, uh, as I am not a technologist, but this is just how I've been able to learn over the years. So uh, AI is a very buzzy word that means a lot of different things. Uh, so you have things that are a little bit more static, like an automated Excel sheet, perhaps. Um, facial recognition is something that is a machine learning model. Uh, so what you do is you have to be able to train the algorithm the same way that you perhaps would teach a child something, right? So this is cup, this is not cup, this is not cup, okay? 
Um, so specifically for facial recognition, what the um, system is doing is you go through photos and you need a lot, a lot, a lot of data to be able to do this in an accurate way. It is taking vectors of your face. So how far apart are your eyes? How far is your nose from your mouth? different vectors all across your face and creating a kind of template, a facial template from that. And for that to actually be able to be tied to an identity, there has to be a database that it is matched against. So for Facebook, obviously that is its Facebook users. Um, so in the context of the photo tagging, what you would do is uh, one of your friends would tag you in a photo and basically you would be doing the work of a Facebook developer in identifying that person for the algorithm and the algorithm would continue to learn um, what this person's face looks like over time. Okay. Does anybody want to add to that? Well, I know quite a bit about how <laughs> Facebook system system works. That, that, that's, that's pretty accurate, I would say. Um, one of the interesting things about how Facebook system works is that people have this idea of like the FBI database that you can upload any photo and then just compare it to the thousands of photos and you'll be able to identify, oh, it's that person. Facebook system actually worked in a really interesting way that would prevent that kind of mass surveillance from being able to take effect. So it, when a, if you were to opt into the facial recognition system, the, com the computer would create an algorithm of basically like a signature of your face. Um, and that signature could be matched to other signatures to see if they are an exact match with some error of, like, some margin of error. Uh, but it doesn't go through the entire system. The amount of photos that are uploaded to Facebook's global system would just not make sense. We could not power the entire servers that would require to go through every four billion photo that was uploaded every day. So if you upload a photo, and what would happen is first the system would identify, is there a face in this photo? Then it would say, okay, Eric uploaded this photo. Who are the hundred people that we think are most likely to be in a photo with Eric based on who he's tagged and who he's been with and who he's been around with? And of those hundred people, oh, 50 people have opted in to facial recognition and we have signatures for them. So we would create a temporary signature of that uploaded photo and compare it to those 50 and say, is it one of these people? And if it is, it's like, hey, Eric, is this who it is? Tag him. Sure, if not, it's not. But it was an interesting way of designing it, so it would actually be impossible if the FBI showed up with a photo of someone, say, a January 6th rioter, and said, hey, we want you to go through your global system and find this person. We literally couldn't do it. Um, so that's accurate, just a little bit of an interesting way of how the Facebook system worked. Yeah. Cool. Um, so thanks. Uh, so that gives us a little bit of a grounding in, in sort of what technology we're talking about here. Um, I'd be curious if anybody on the panel would be willing to talk about the privacy concerns raised by face recognition technology more broadly and specifically as it relates to Facebook um, and particularly I think as it relates to marginalized communities because we hear that a lot. So uh, there's a couple aspects of privacy of facial recognition presenting privacy problems. One of them is that your face is something that can't really change, generally does not change, and so if a company is collecting your face and it for some reason loses control of it or it gets breached or uh, it just is used for, for nefarious purposes, you know, you can't change your face like you could change a credit card number or a debit card number or, or you know, something out of your email address or your phone number or password or whatever, like all that is changeable easily. Uh, it's annoying, but it's, it is easy, relatively easy to change those things. If it's your face, obviously your options are quite limited, and if a company gets breached and your, your you know, biometric information gets leaked out, then it's just sort of there. You can't really do much about it. So that's one of the privacy things. One of the, one of the uh, another privacy issue with regard to facial recognition is more of a law enforcement concern, which is like if law enforcement has access to a person's face and can review, uh, let's say, like a, a photo of a bunch of people protesting, uh, then and if they can figure out the identities of everybody just by looking at that, just by running it through um, a facial recognition system, then they figure out, okay, this is the identity of everybody in this room or everybody in, at the protest and figure out, okay, who who can we sort of 
harass or arrest or something because they, you know, police have have a lot of different motives. And I'm not saying I'm not imputing any one particular motive on any of them, but we have we have seen that police have somewhat misused these types of technologies before, uh, and so yeah, that uh, another yeah another privacy concern is, is how law enforcement uses it. Uh, we were talking a little bit on the last panel about facial recognition, and I think this is something that Facebook. Meta has been thinking about is like what are the good uses of facial recognition if there are any. And I think one of the more uh, generally accepted uses of facial recognition is sort of like a one-to-one -one matching, which is essentially verifying you are the person you say you are. So you upload a photo of yours of your face to some sort of system, and they have a photo of you on their back end, and they say they compare the photo that you uploaded to the photo that they have that they know is the right photo and they say, okay, you are the right person who is you know, requesting this public benefit or is verifying that they are the owner of this Facebook account or whatever. Uh, those tend to be less objectionable uses, at least in my view, of facial recognition technology as opposed to the more like dragnet surveillance kind of concern, which we definitely pose, um, and just the general increasing privacy concern over allowing a lot of companies to collect face information or other biometric information uh, for a variety of purposes. And I'm sure I've missed a bunch, so that's a question. Yeah, no. I was just going to point to the, um, I think, discrimination point, uh, specifically against protected classes, marginalized communities. Um, there's kind of a motto in tech, it's like garbage in, garbage out. So a lot of these systems, if you're not using data that is representative of people, specifically for uh, facial recognition systems, so you're not uploading data of women, you're not uploading data of darker sc skinned people, um, that system is going to be far less accurate than um, what your data is mostly representative of, which uh, historically has been, you know, white men. And so it has gotten better over time, but there have definitely been instances of where this actually has legal effects in terms of they wrongfully arrest a black man when it is so clearly not him to like the average eye. Um, or they're using these systems and just like generally uh, exacerbating like, existing discrimination because, you know, if you're not training it right, you're going to continue to use these algorithms more and more in your everyday lives and continue to exacerbate it. Um. So obviously it's a very uh, fraught and, <laughs> and controversial topic, um, but obviously it does it does have some uses that are good and some that are bad. Nathan, you know, as a as a vocal privacy advocate now employed at Meta, um, how do you think about kind of you know obviously you know all the risks, you know all the concerns that that the community's laid out, and and you obviously are also thinking about some of the promises that this data can. So you know you help make this decision. Can you talk about how Facebook is? You know, weighs these sorts of things, and how do you how do you weigh these risks against each other? Yeah, um, first of all, I, I, there are a lot of risks of facial recognition. There are some really cool things that you can do with it, but there are risks too. And one of the difficulties in establishing what the risks are is having a clear definition of what facial recognition is. One of the biggest challenges in all of this space is that advocates, regulators, and researchers are all speaking wildly different language. The term biometric, for example, has legal definitions that vary in what area you are. So if you think about AI and computer vision, there's an, a giant scale of what you can do with computer vision. That you can take up any camera really made since the 90s and say, hey, there's a face. Focus on that in the face and autofocus in that space. Super useful and it's identifying a face. Then you can get a little bit more specific in what is in that face of where are the eyes, where are the ears, so we can do cool things like put cat filters on them. Lots of fun, lots of fun with Snapchat. Then you can get into more levels of analysis of what the faces are. You can do things that are relatively easy for us to understand, like group all of the people that have red hair or group all of the people who have mustaches. But the AI and machine learning has been trained in such a way it can do really interesting things that we actually don't understand that well. It can get into, show me all of the people that you predict as a certain gender. Show me all of the people that you predict as a certain age. Show me all of the people who might have had a mustache six months ago. How the system does that, we can't explain it, but it's actually pretty accurate, kind of weird. You can also do really interesting things with similarity scores. So you can say, 
not using the distance of your eyes, not using any kind of human readable thing, the system will create signatures that are similar and say anyone with a similar signature, combine them together. And you can get really up there and say, combine all the signatures that might look like a serial killer with a wide, wild degree of inaccuracy because we don't have that many serial killers that you can say. But you could also just go and say, show us all the people who are likely to buy a razor. And that technology is actually being used by billboards in the European Union and in London to do real-time bidding on what ads people see of what is the makeup of the audience in the real world. You don't even need to be in computers anymore. Then you can even get more and more specific to, is this within this group of people? To what Eric said, with the one-to-one -one matching is when you create a signature and you are have a signature on your phone and say, is the face being uploaded? Does it match that signature exactly? Yes or no binary. You can also have one to a thousand of here's a thousand photos. Is this face anywhere in those photos? So the established definition among courts, generally, not, ex not exhaustively, is that facial recognition is only when you are comparing a signature to a known signature to confirm ID. That means if I'm comparing a signature to an unknown signature and just saying these are the same person, but I'm not identifying them, that is not considered to be facial recognition. Sure sounds a lot like facial recognition to me, but they call that facial clustering or image clustering. That's what your phone is doing when it creates those montages of your kid's birthday party. It's saying all these people are the same. We don't know who they are. We're not trying to identify them, so it's not facial recognition, but we're just putting them together. Fun fact, Apple's being sued under BIPA in Illinois for that. Uh, I'm sure we'll get into some of the details of there. So clustering and image similarities, that can get really dangerous really fast, particularly just today, Walmart is being sued for this technology because it's really helpful to be able to identify your customers as who they are. Maybe you wanna know what people are doing as a unique individual. Do men go th through your store this way? Do women go through your store this way? Also, you can identify, are these unique people? Is this a valued customer? If you can tie them to a loyalty number, it might not be considered facial recognition because you haven't uniquely identified them by name, but you uniquely identify them with a unique and persistent identifier that you can track. Also very helpful for loss. If you are looking for people who are shoplifting, you can create your systems to train on people who might shoplift. Errors based on race get really serious really fast there. You can also track people across jurisdictions. If somebody is thought to be shoplifting in a Walmart in Illinois and they go into a, a Walmart in Massachusetts, instantly the system can light them up. That is unregulated. That is not being really paid attention to much in the facial recognition, but in my mind, it's really, really, really close to facial recognition. And the farther you get away from it, you can get more and more interesting things with computer analysis and, and uh, facial analysis. Uh, but the facial recognition definition of that uniquely identifying you is where the conversation is most mostly at today. So expanding a little bit on, I think the risks of just facial recognition miss a lot of the real use cases today that I think are causing harms. I didn't ask, answer your question at all there, did I? <laughs> uh, I'll, just, I'll just ramble a little did bit, you I guess. see my, my wheels turning a little bit? <laughs> I was like, wait, did I get an answer? Uh, so I guess uh, uh, before I answer that, another question is why was I the person who was reviewing our facial recognition program? I, I said earlier I was recruited by Meta to come help. When I worked for, when I came over to Facebook from Access Now, uh, I, work, I was recruited to work in an area called Building 8 that everything we do in augmented reality, virtual reality, everything since the rebrand of the company as Meta, used to be a classified department called Building 8 that other people within the company weren't allowed to know. I was brought in as a privacy consultant to advise on, hey, there's some you know pretty interesting stuff with all these cameras that are on all the time that are monitoring things all the time. How should we build this system? So we were building out augmented reality use case and we were looking at things that we might build. And one of the use cases with augmented reality that becomes very easy for people to understand is facial recognition. That there are examples like we're at a conference with 80,000 people. I'm bad with faces. I haven't been here in three years. It would be really awesome to be able to identify and like, hey, Scott, I haven't seen you. And I recognize what like the system could help identify. So we were looking at, should we build something like that? That would be a really cool use case. On the other hand, kind of easy to see how facial recognition glasses could be misused. 
So we went through a pretty serious review of trying to decide, should we build this? Is this the right thing to build? Is this going to be really cool? Is this going to be abused? Let's do a policy and legal analysis. There were legal teams, there were, pro there were uh, product teams that worked with me, and I, I read our, led our policy review of it. And as we were considering whether or not this is a thing that we should build in the future, we started also considering, is this a thing we really should be doing today? Is this really a useful thing that people on Facebook want? Is this a valuable thing that is worth the money and the headache of what we're doing? And so we looked at both the forward use cases in the future, and we looked at the way things were doing, and we talked to hundreds of advocates around the world about whether or not this was something that we should do or something that we shouldn't do. Ultimately, we decided for a few different reasons, the, w the right thing to do was to shut the system down. I won't lie, the system is incredibly expensive. What I described about processing every photo that's uploaded and looking at all of your friends, it's just really expensive. And frankly, not a lot of people are, want to use that, particularly in the developing world where computers and your, and your pockets are not nearly as powerful. It wasn't even being used, it was being disabled because it slowed the system down too much. Also, people were changing. People were saying that they weren't using as much. Tag suggestions people weren't interested in. We were also hearing from a lot of advocates that the technology itself was inherently causing a problem and it was not something that we as a company should be developed. We also looked at the legal landscape and said, where is the world going with this? If we invest all this money to build this new system that would require consents of people that you hadn't talked to yet, very complicated, very expensive system, is it even gonna be legal by the time we build it? And so ultimately what we decided is there are, there are some really good use cases for facial recognition. We're building AR glasses. They don't have keyboards that you can put in your password. We have to unlock it to you some way. We're gonna use periocular peri authentication, which is basically face recognition just for your eye. We know we wanna do that. So we know that this technology is useful. It's what you do with your iPhone. So you use your face unlock. We think that those are relatively useful. There's also uses today that are really, really helpful. For example, in banking and know your own customer laws where to have online banks and to have electronic banks that are widely available to prevent money laundering and fraud, you do have to identify your customer. And in some places, facial recognition is a really good way to, to do that. And we've built, that, built certain systems for that. It can also help with account recovery. If you lost your password or somebody hijacks your password, you can send us a selfie and we can figure out if that is your account and give it back to you. Lots of useful things that we could do with the technology, but also lots of risk with the technology. And other companies were using the technology in difficult ways that we weren't so in, in favor of. Also, the law is really confusing here. I'm sure we're going to talk about BIPA and KUBI in Texas and biometric expanding definitions in Europe. But one of the challenges, I'm sorry, this is really long. I told you this was going to be a long it's answer. Okay. It's okay. One of the problems in Illinois is they don't use the term they don't use any of the technical terms. They talk about facial geometry. And facial geometry is where your eyes are at and where your ears are at. Maybe, or maybe it means something higher level. We don't actually know because people keep getting sued under law, under BIPA and the penalties are so high, everyone settles. No one actually goes to court and gets a legal definition. So our lawyers can't tell us what the, de what the definitions are. They expand over time, not saying or lawyers, but it just means we don't have any clarity. So one of the things that we said when we deprecated the system was there might be really good uses for this technology, but we just don't need to be at the forefront of it right now. This is not our what we're trying to build. We're trying to build AR glasses and there are a lot of really cool things we can do with them without facial recognition. But on the other hand, it would be really nice if there was legal clarity that if this is something we could build, I'm sure we could figure out how to do it in a way that would make conferences like this pretty cool. Um, so you covered a lot of ground there. Um, specifically, we heard the, the acronym BIPA, which I don't know if folks are familiar with, but it is the Biometric Information, inform, by, gosh, I'm sorry, I'm just tripping over my words today. <laughs> Biometric Information Privacy Act, which is an Illinois state law. Um, I'm, I would encourage either of my um, fellow advocates on the panel, um, if, you know, we, we heard a lot about sort of how uh, companies have this conversation internally. I was hoping you could discuss some of the regulatory or consumer pressures we've seen um, on Facebook and other companies to re-examine how they're, how they're also looking at and collecting this information. Yeah, so, and I don't know if any of y'all were on the panel earlier this morning, I'll kind of go back to the same framework, which is uh, we don't have a comprehensive federal privacy bill, which means that this is largely not regulated on a federal level. It's regulated on a state-by-state -state basis, and obviously you've heard a lot about the Illinois Biometric Privacy Act. 
Um, the other thing that's worth mentioning is the government is actually pretty regulated. They, the Department of Homeland Security overlooks a lot of the biometrics work that the U.S. government does, and there is a lot of law and what they need to comply by. Those same regulations do not apply to private entities, so they don't have the same level of needing to get consent, needing to have certain lev levels of accuracies or audits on them. However, of course, some companies are doing this, some companies are not. Um, so in a prior life, uh, I did a lot of Illinois BIPA compliance and litigation. And like what Nathan was saying, it is very, very hostile environment because people do not know what biometrics are. Um, there is a lot of different ways to approach it. But largely, just so you have an idea of like what the law does um, and why generally biometric laws are important, is you have to get consent particularly if it, is, if it is identifying you as a person. Uh, you have to have certain security standards because as we talked about before, like you cannot change your face. Uh, you have to uh, be able to have a publicly available like retention schedule and all these different things. So that law was passed, I think in like 2008 or something like that. And like nobody heard about it. Like it was just really passed under the radar. And it wasn't, I believe, until Facebook got sued under it that people actually started paying attention to this law and it started to actually become a really hot bed for lawsuits to happen. Um, and so all of that to say is uh, Illinois, Texas, and Washington are the only states where these practices are largely regulated. And even in those places, there is a lot of confusion um, where there's a lot of use cases that need to be mitigated uh, and regulated more. And there are also use cases where it is pretty innocuous and companies are still getting sued and it is probably hindering some level of innovation in space. Uh, it, an example, Apple is being sued for that facial recognition on your phone. And Apple says, we are not doing that. You shouldn't sue us. It's the individual consumers because it lives on the phone and we don't control it. And the, the courts have so far appeared to be somewhat skeptical of, well, it exists on the phone because you created the software and put it on the, on the phone. And I'm not a lawyer and I don't recall the specifics, so somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's $5,000 per instance of violation which means Apple would be faced with $5,000 fine for every photo every Apple user, every iPhone user had taken in Illinois since 2008. If you think that the size of the penalties, that's why people settle. We're not going to, I don't know what's happening with Apple. It's a case I'm really interested in, particularly the on-device argument, so I'm watching it. But if they don't settle, the, the industry is going to respond and say, okay, well, Apple got sued for this and they had to settle, so that means from now on, any kind of on-device processing would also be included in this, which means all of that innovation is going to get either shut down or locked out of Illinois. So that's like the example of like this really does have effect because we just don't know how to plan around it. Yeah, and it's also a really interesting question of like what is a privacy violation? Like when does it occur? So like what he's talking about is like so there's also fingerprint scanning, which a lot of you are probably familiar with. A lot of employee or employers use them for time clocking, right? Um, is it a privacy violation if you don't get consent every single time an employee is clocking or clocking in or clocking out? Some people are saying yes. Some people are saying no, it's only the first time. Um, and so it's a really interesting, even theoretical question on a larger privacy level, like what, what is a privacy violation? How does it occur and when? Yeah, and this sort of gets back to, um, it's like a, this information is not changed changeable or fixable or whatever, and people tend to view it as creepy, they tend to view it as intrusive, they generally don't like it, at least for the, when in the negative use cases where, you know, something is used against them, obviously, I think a lot of people like the Face ID uh, ability to unlock your phone on, or unlock your iPhone on, uh, for Apple, but generally speaking, when people hear about, you know, data breaches, they tend to be more concerned about what's called sensitive data, which is data that we tend to make, to tend to protect more because it is more indicative uh, or more privacy intrusive. So location, biometric, obviously, uh, you know, financial information, health information, all that stuff that we generally want to keep fairly private. Uh, people tend to get a little more spooked when things, when bad things happen with their data, when particularly when it relates to sensitive data. So I think the same thing is true about facial recognition. There's obviously a tremendous amount of pressure on companies to 
not do any of the bad things, to have uh, you know full <laughs> foolproof uh, security systems around anything that is biometric, and obviously that's impossible. But certainly some companies do it better than others, and so there's yeah there's a lot of pressure, and then of course the the constant BIPA lawsuit I think is also sort of a fire under companies' butts to make to make sure that they're paying attention to this and and not doing things that people don't like with with their biometric data. Yeah, and if I could recognize myself, it's <laughs> weird to be a moderator panelist, but um, uh, you know, so we actually we at EFF we advocate for state BIPAs in, in a lot of states. We we ran one in California. We worked with one uh, in a, for a legislator in Maine. We worked on one in Maryland. I think there is some um, discussion of how it should evolve right now that we've seen how Illinois has played out. You know, what does consent mean, right? In, in, in Illinois, it says specifically written consent. So does that mean a, a pop-up on your phone or does it mean I have to actually sign a, a thing? So I think um, as we're looking at possibly bringing BIPA or introducing BIPA in other states, we are kind of trying to evaluate, you know, what has changed since 2008? How would we change that language? Um, but, you know, we also do want to address the real the real harms and the real, um, you know, the real concerns that there are about facial recognition technology, and it, it, you know, we see it popping up more, especially getting a little away from Facebook. So sorry about that, but um, we see it popping up more, especially in, in the workplace. So we're like we're thinking a lot about employee privacy and employee monitoring and, and collection of biometric information. So BIPA has to cover a lot of things um, all at once. Um, let's see. Uh, so given sort of this this ongoing conversation and strong opinions on all sides about, about biometric data collection and uh, ongoing regulatory uncertainty. I'm, I am curious how folks think um, Facebook and other companies will approach innovation in this space and um, uh, the issue and, and sort of uh, biometrics beyond face in, in the future, right? I mean, uh, you mentioned a couple things like, could we really see you know, different features being shut off in certain states? Um, you know, practically speaking, what might that be? Uh, al almost, almost certainly, um, almost certainly, things are going to get geogated around Illinois and Texas. Um, it's just there's there's no upside to offering it if those are the downsides. Though I I think we'll see probably a lot more of that. I think there's probably also a lot going on. People are thinking, looking at what GDPR is, how it's going to be interpreted. There seems to be new new understandings of what special category data is, and so I think EU is probably going to be the one that sort of gives us some clarity and the world will probably build around EU standards in the next five to 10 year time horizon. But I think the first thing we need is just some sort of understanding of what definitions are across jurisdictions. That the definition of biometric under GDPR today is information that is uniquely used to uniquely identify you. So a signature of your face is not biometric information until I use it to, to uniquely identify you. That's kind of confusing. Most people aren't going to really understand that way. But that means that we can also do, we can also make face signatures of everybody in a room, figure out who are in the room, figure out what other conferences you're going to, and it's not biometric information until we identify you. That in some ways is a good thing because it allows all of the computer vision around facial analysis to be done. And a lot of other, particularly in Europe, regulators are in favor of some of the things that we can do with that technology. There's a lot of discussion around protecting youth. How do you build an internet that is separate for people who are under 13 versus 13 to 18? And you know what? Kids lie. If you just ask them, they're going to lie. Uh, but facial, not facial recognition, but facial analysis, which is the very thing that's very, 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 very similar to facial recognition, can allow you to identify people in fairly accurate <laughs> Uh, age bands, but then you have to have another system to allow people to challenge that because sometimes people look young and there are error rates. The, I, I think there is going to continue to be innovation up until that space of that uniquely identifying you line. However, there's a lot of fear within you know the the AI and tech people that uh, that I work with of that line is that used to uniquely identify you. If that line moves, that could cut off a lot of what is happening in, in the computer vision space. Yeah, I'll add on briefly. Uh, 
definitely have seen companies just not want to operate at all in Illinois. That means not hiring Illinois employees, not using servers in Illinois, like just trying to avoid it altogether. Um, I've also seen it go the other way where they're like, okay, well, we have to get consent of all employees in Illinois. We're just going to institute this company wide. So at a certain level, Illinois has, for some companies, just set the ground level of their privacy practices for biometrics, and that's probably a positive thing. Um, and there was a recent uh, settlement with Clearview AI, which is a really notorious uh, facial recognition company. And largely what happened is they found that this company had violated BIPA in a lot of different ways and some pretty egregious ways. Um, and, but as part of the settlement, it was instituted nationwide. So Clearview AI wasn't allowed to do a lot of their practices, not only in Illinois, but across the country because they just saw it to be so pervasive. Uh, Eric, actually, I know your, your program at CBT recently published a report looking at face recognition and, and really did look at Clearview a lot. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, so uh, that report is uh, very much based on law enforcement concerns. It was actually drafted uh, by my colleague, Jake. And yeah, that looked at sort of like what are states doing and localities doing in response to a, a, a vast increase in the use of facial recognition in law enforcement. And there are, there's a variety of different ways that states have addressed this. Some of them have very strong bans on use of facial recognition in law enforcement. Some of them have middle, middle ground stuff so it can't be used for certain types of offenses or something like that. So this, I mean, this really grew out of Clearview because so Clearview basically created a, a facial recognition algorithm by studying the faces, the faces of uh, people that they upload to social media to their profiles. So uh, a lot of social media, pro some of some social media profiles are public and photos are often public. And so Clearview just created a system that got all those faces and uh, created created a uh, system that they then sold to law enforcement who would use it to identify people. And this was, uh, you know, again, going back to my point of this sort of freaking people out and uh, people being really uncomfortable with this, you know, there are states that are starting to take more action with regard to uh, law enforcement and facial recognition. Cool. Um. Okay, well, we've covered a lot of ground. I'm gonna um, start to open it up for questions. So questions, start start thinking and make your way to the mic. Um, I am curious that from the panel, you know, given kind of all the discussion around it, what, what do you see in the in the short term? Like, it, obviously there's a lot of regu regulatory pressure. Facebook has paused this. Is it like a stop? Is it a pause along the way of a, of a journey? Um, just kind of curious what Well, my understanding is that the underlying technology still exists. It's just the faces that are deleted, <laughs> the face information that is deleted. So obviously, as Nathan said, Facebook, uh, Facebook invested a lot of money in developing the system. So to expect them to delete that, you know, whether it's reasonable or not is sort of up to the, <laughs> it's in the eye of the beholder. But certainly what they did do was at least good for privacy in the sense that they no longer have the raw data of this is this, this is the facial signature of, of X person, and uh, so you know, obviously Meta is developing AR VR. They want to use at least aspects of facial recognition for that. So they're um, I don't work in the company, so I can't speak directly to it. But obviously they're thinking hard about these questions and trying to figure out okay, what do we actually want to do with this? And uh, yeah, there's obviously like billion different ways they can go with it and it'll be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, we, we could turn, we could turn, build a new face rec system. We, sure, the, the technology still like, exists out there. Um, the way that we would do it is we would have anybody who wanted to opt in, you would definitely have to opt into the system because in addition to all the regulatory consent, Facebook is also subject to an FTC consent order, uh, which specifically addresses how we use facial recognition. So even if the laws were ambiguous, for us to use facial recognition, we have to have consent. 
So if you consented, if Eric said, yes, I want to consent, you would say, you would click a button, and what would happen on the back end is we would look through all the photos you've uploaded, try to identify which one is likely you, that you had been tagged in, and then take 100 or 150 of those photos, run it through an AI algorithm that would split out that unique signature, and it would create a unique signature for you that we could then compare to photos that were uploaded in the future. Um, what we did when we shut the system down was delete every single one of those templates for every user that had ever opted in. And so, yeah, we could rebuild it. It would be in a massive amount of processing power. In fact, even deleting that much information required an entire engineering team to figure out how we were gonna delete it and how we were gonna be able to make sure it got off our system and to be able to explain to the FTC when it was gone from our system, when it would be writ overwritten on our servers so we couldn't get it back. But yeah, the technology still exists that we could we could do that that we could turn it back on if that's what people people were interested in. Um, where it comes up for me more often is particularly in the virtual reality space. And virtual reality is growing pretty fast. And if you've used virtual reality, there's a lot of really fun things you can do. You can blow up, you can do Beat Saber, you can shoot stuff, you can fight stuff. There's a lot of fun. But it's also the graphics aren't particularly good because you have, le in a lot of ways, less processing power than this iPhone does on your face, and you have to do all the processing there. And so there's a lot of ways that we want to use this sort of, I call it human characteristics data to improve your experience. The first being, we wanna know where your eyes are looking so that you don't, and you're in an avatar and you're talking to an avatar, you're not looking at a blank stare, you're looking at somebody who's giving you eye contact and moving you around and reasonable and moving your face. We also want, my face moves, my hands move, I'm expression, I have these micro expressions. We wanna be able to translate those into VR and so we have to be very careful of when are we processing a camera on your face to make an emotive avatar without crossing these lines into, ah, now suddenly we're in a new area where we need a new kind of consent or there's, there's legal um, problems gets even further when we get into AR where you don't have, well, I should, I should stick with, with VR and, and what's in the next year or two. Uh, so that's, that's really where we're, we're talking about, where we're using these, that it's not specifically about uh, the facial recognition. It's just where you're trying to follow where is this going and what can we use and how can we use and what kind of consents and explanations do we need to get. Consents are also really challenging because right now, a lot of the things that you do, you're using the camera that faces you. And a lot of the companies are starting to look at the back of the camera. And you think of Snapchat, you take people's photos, you do interesting things. When you take photos, how do I get consent of the people who are in those photos? You as the person who holds the phone probably can't consent on their behalf, so we could just pass the liability off to you and say, by using this, you authorize that you've got consent and nobody's gonna read it. Uh, so. Where, where we're at is not so much in the desire to build facial recognition stuff, it's we're trying to figure out where exactly these lines are and how can we get regulatory clarity so that what we're building for stuff that we know is gonna come out in a few years makes sense and is not you know on the wrong side of the line and, and, and causes problems. Where we do wanna use facial recognition in the next few years are what I already said. Uh, we definitely, we're pretty confident we're gonna wanna use periocular authentication for your hardware. We may want to start using that in our quest to make it easier to unlock because you don't have a keyboard and it's hard to type with, with controllers. Um, and we want to do it with device recovery. Um, if, if you lose your account or a hacker takes your account, that's an area where people really seem to want us to be able to use it. That they say, oh, can't you see it's my, my pictures are in there. Uh, and the other is we're, if, if the company does more in the financial services to comply with know your customer laws, pretty much the only way we can figure out how to do that is with financial or with facial recognition. Uh, however, where we've done that now, or we are doing that today, we're outsourcing it to other companies like Toby, T-O-B-I-I, uh, from the UK, instead of developing it in-house. And I'll round us out here. <laughs> uh, I kind of back to an earlier point. I agree with Nathan a lot that computer vision is going to be really the next frontier. I mean, it's already here, but it's going to be so enmeshed in our lives that biometrics will be a regulation that is going to happen. And it's been really, really fastly growing um, from AR and VR to remote proctoring. You know, they're tracking your eyes where you're at. Um, there's just a, a number of use cases that j just continues to evolve and evolve. Uh, emotion detection, like people are going to try to figure out, you know, are you sad? Do you need a therapist? You know, things like that. And so states, because there is no federal law, 
likely with ADPA not passing, uh, going to continue to introduce these. Um, and the FTC, I anticipate, will also start ramping up a lot of more of their enforcement actions, specifically against these facial recognition companies. Um, the last point I want to make also, and this kind of goes a little bit more to government, is globally a lot of different governments are exploring something called digital identity, which is when, <laughs> hard to explain, um, you have biometrics you know, of what your face is, fingerprints, and it's attached to all of these different things about you on a government level, right? Your driver's license, you all saw this with maybe when you filed your taxes with the IRS, all these different things that relate to your identity as it relates to the government largely. Um, as that continues to evolve and probably will be a part and already has been starting to be a part of other countries, we will need to start thinking more, especially when these are companies that are doing this collection. It's not always the government specifically, it's government using other private companies. So anyways, I think we should open it up to questions. <laughs> yeah. So please, if you have questions, uh, please approach the mic. Hello. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for putting on the panel. Uh, I just started doing an ethics class for software uh, in my master's, so this is kind of hitting home really hard right about now. Um, but the biggest points that I, I think about when I think about all the privacy questions is first, awareness, right? Awareness of what your data is going towards, how it's being affected, like how it is affecting you, and you know, like, because I could, I could agree to one thing, right? And then it, the data stays there in the background, you know, and then, oh, okay, we're just gonna use it for this other feature to test, you know? And a, a lot of times when a feature goes wrong or something gets leaked, you know, that's when people get riled up, like you were saying, where, you know, like, oh my God, this is, this is the worst thing ever. And then they're like, oh, you agreed to it. And we're like, did we? You know, it, it's, it's that awareness factor of like, how does Meta, you know, currently, how do they make people exactly aware in like not legalese, not like read the full terms and services? How do they make people aware of what is going on with their data for the duration that Meta uses it? You know, great, great question. Uh, it's actually one of the reasons why I, I come to DragonCon and I convince Meta that they should still let me come here, uh, even now that I work there. One of the reasons is um, to get people thinking about where things are going. Uh, particularly with the augmented reality side of thing, I think about consent a lot in that if none of this makes any sense, the consent doesn't mean anything. That if I'm speaking to you in a made up language that you couldn't possibly understand and then you consent, it does not mean anything. Um, so a lot of the technologies that we're developing were, are, require some level of consent and the problem is if I make you go through and consent to all of these things, you're not gonna read any of them, you're not gonna understand what it is, and I'm gonna make you spend two hours consenting to things before the device works. Mm -hmm. So it is a, a huge challenge and something that we think about. We have internal design teams that recommend on how we can do consent, and we do a bunch of user ex user research on in trying to be as simple as possible and as clear as possible to explain what we're doing when we require consent and give examples. However, there are also challenges is if you're uploading a photo, you don't want to read a bunch of stuff. You want to upload the photo and people just sort of click through. So the understanding is, I think, a huge problem with the consent regime that we have. There is, whenever third party data brokers get in trouble, they always say, oh, well, all of this data was consented to. And you look at that and you're like, nobody in this country has ever heard of this company. I, I, I didn't consent it to, you know, I use apps. So it is, it is a challenge. The way that I think about it personally is we need to make things as intuitively as possible so it intrinsically sort of just makes sense to a wide swath of people. And then we also have to do user education on the back end. We also have to do a lot of work and outreach and education to other experts who can explain things and talk about things in the media and to constituents so that we're not only relying on clicking through when you use it. Because most people... Most people, they're not, they're not reading what they're clicking through. They're listening to the zeitgeist of Apple good, Facebook bad, so it must be okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I can definitely see a lot of the downside to misused facial recognition technology and algorithms. And, but I'm actually one of the people who would benefit from it. I have a disorder that makes it difficult for me to recognize faces. <laughs> I used to get in trouble all the time for it. Now I just wave at everyone like they're a friend and, you know, it's good luck. 
I'm not as bad as Chuck Close, but if you look up that guy, you'll see how bad it can get. Uh, the other thing is, I was in um, Canadian City, can't remember the name of it at the moment, it'll come to me, at one of their museums, and one of the art displays was they had pasted the EULAs, the user agreements, to the floor, and they grew in different lengths until one of them was long enough to actually leave the sala where this art display was going on. And uh, Mr. Meta, feel free to pass this on. Uh, in order to any of your center board, for them to join the two comma club, I think they should be obligated by contract to read all of that EULA <laughs> out loud. <laughs> Just to to share us in our pain. You know, nobody could possibly <laughs> keep track or you know follow this thing. But after that, maybe they deserve some of that, you know, two comma plus pay. They, they actually do make me read our privacy policies and I don't enjoy it either. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I have my Oculus too. I freaking love that thing. Keep going. It's pretty sweet technology. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, when we shut down the, the system, well, first of all, one a lot of the ways that we were looking at using it facial recognition for really cool stuff we wanted to build was accessibility for one, a conference like this where there's lots of people and you imagine everybody could consent when they buy their tickets, that when they're here, they would upload their photo, they'd create, everybody be consent. We could even do time and geolocation so it would only work in certain hours so we could shut it off at midnight. Like we got, we, we think we've got some pretty cool ways to build some neat things. But they're also incredibly helpful for people like salespeople who meet a lot of people who want to store personal information or store information about people. They're also incredibly helpful for people who are blind or hard of hearing to explain this is who people are. And the, the condition you have, I'm trying to remember, I used to remember, I talked to several people in that community that were advocating, yes, we should build this. Uh, we thought of really interesting ways to do it. And when we did shut down the system, privacy advocates were mostly good. Not sure where you're hiding the ball, but this seems good. Uh, but where we really got hit from accessibility advocates, that if you look through a bunch of photos on Instagram, the information of having the computer vision can tell you, here are two people sitting under a tree over a river. That's not very helpful, but if you can say, this is your brother and your sister sitting under a tree, that is so much more helpful. And so we actually got a lot of blowback from accessibility community because we killed a lot of really useful features for people who are using our systems who had visual uh, impairments. So it was a, a big trade-off and there are still people who are not very happy with us about that. Well, from an education, educating standpoint, it seems like the potential perfect tool for non-conventionally educable kids, kids who want to learn things through a different venue. Thanks. So actually, we had some internal conversations that we encouraged our policy and regulatory teams of like, we don't really care what the answer is, but regulatory certainty would be really cool here because if we can build it, there's a lot of neat things we want to do, and we really don't want our competition to build something, and we didn't we didn't start building it, and they you know released the killer app. So like, that would be helpful, whatever the answer is. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna cut you off because we've only got a few minutes left and this gentleman has been waiting, but thank yeah. you. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a shame that uh, there's historical abuse of face recognition by uh, law enforcement because, you know, for serious crime, murder, or, or, or things like uh, the, the Boston uh, Marathon bombings or terrorists, I mean, face recognition can really make the a difference between finding the, uh, the, the uh, murderers or the, the, uh, the terrorists or, and not finding it. But anyway, that's not my question. My question is, you talked a lot about uh, periocular um, recognition uh, as if it's something different uh, than face recognition. Uh, can you explain a little more? Because to me, it seems like it's the same, but it's just looking at a different region, but it's still face recognition, right? So facial recognition, the courts seem to think it means creating a face signature and comparing that to a known face signature to uniquely identify a, a, an individual. Periocular ID, is this section of your face, which is not your face, and therefore by definition is not facial recognition, it is something else. 
nonetheless, it's still regulated under the same law. It's just they would call it an iris scan. Yeah. Well, it actually is not the iris. They wouldn't we, care. We don't do it just they on the iris. Care. We're going to do it. It's, but it's, basic, it's so, basically so it facial is, recognition so, of this part of your body. Yeah, it's face recognition by a legal technicality. It's not considered face recognition is what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. The That's ambiguity fine. in the language is really complicated. That's fine. That's fine. You know, we, we do have, I know Eric, you know this, under our, a lot of our national security rules for, for surveillance, we have exceptions for nat nuclear nonproliferation and counterterrorism. That is something that law enforcement can consider, but they don't seem to want to draw the line there. Okay, so my question, I guess, is for each one of you, like, where do you, like, obviously there's a lot of confusion with the regulatory framework, right? Um, what do you guys feel as is the like the best thing from your perspective? Like, what should the regulatory framework be? What should the laws be? And it's okay if it's a little bit like vague, right? Because obviously, we won't know the specifics of like this degree of like your face is okay and this like fifty more degrees is, is wrong. Okay. Like, so, what what do you, each of you think? Uh, this is a tough question. It is a tough question. And I'm going to give somewhat of a cop-out answer, which is that if there was a way to, to allow the, the good uses of facial recognition and disallow the bad uses of facial recognition, that would be the most ideal regulatory framework. Uh, but then, of course, you get into questions of what's good and what's bad. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's inherently difficult because there are, with every technology, there are things that will improve people's lives and there are things that will not improve people's lives and just figuring out how to address those two things um, you know often in tech policy we uh, are presented with this issue of if you pass some kind of protection like a privacy protection or a protection over biometric or facial recognition or whatever um, you know it can be used for good and for bad, or there can be workarounds that can be used for good or for bad, and we always have to be thinking about, okay, if you had, you know, an ADPPA, we have, uh, ADPPA is the, the House Privacy Bill that we talked about earlier today, um, you know, it, it defines face mapping and, and a bunch of different bi biometrics as sensitive data, and so that is given extra protection so companies who are collecting that data can only do it if, they're pro if it's part of the service that they're providing. Um, but if they have some other cool thing they want to do that's not part of the current service they're providing, then that law sort of hinders their ability to do that. So there's, we constantly fight back and forth about what protections are good and, and what protections are best, and there is unfortunately really no good answer. But if there was some way to more accurately allow the good uses and not allow the bad uses, that would be great. Just build a hammer that can't hurt anybody. Essentially, <laughs> yes. Call it Bill O. <laughs> yeah, I, I think about this a lot, honestly. Um, and I think what a law really needs to do is be able to differentiate based on risk of the technology or risk of the use. Um, so considering is this actually being used to identify somebody? Um, so actually, I kind of like the GDPR framework because they differentiate between biometrics that are just regular biometrics. Um, so maybe it's not used to actually identify you, but you know, it's maybe it's behavioral biometrics, you know, how you move eye tracking. Um, and then if it's, it is declared a sensitive category of data once it is currently being used to identify you, and because of that, there is heightened um, obligations and requirements under the law. And I think that's a good way to go about that. And I think they also need to figure out um, excluding these types of computer vision that does not identify you, right? So general detection of a face, general detection of um, this is an ear, this is a nose, that I feel like can be more easily excluded from the current framework. I work for a large corporation, but I don't work for the part that does regulatory advocacy, so I don't think I'm going to answer that question on camera, but if you want to talk after, I have <laughs> opinions. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I show is right at 630, so I think we're good. Thank you so much, uh, all of you, for your time. Much.